Good morning. This is my first time in Hungary. This is my first time in Budapest. And it's very strange for me to be at a conference where I have no idea how I've just been introduced. So I have no idea what you're expecting. I hope I'm not a disappointment. Okay, so I was asked to talk about policy, strategy, and the title of my little session this morning is, is it about time that we de-securitized cybersecurity? Which is probably a challenge for all of us because we all have jobs in cybersecurity. So I had my little outline and I had all my bullet points and I had all my lovely slides. And then I got a question from Arthur. I've now rewritten everything. Okay, so this is the question that I got from Arthur. In case I can answer them during my speech this morning. 99% of incidents will never go near the military. I have NATO in my, in my title, so I guess this is where this is coming from. Arthur's question. If there is a cyber war, shouldn't the military or NATO fight it for us? If, as Mr. Michael Hayden says, quote, the government will be less capable of protecting us in this new domain than it has ever been able to protect us in the physical domains ever. What will NATO do? Fight to the 1%? And if the nature of cyber domain brings the fight to the people, you and me, and the different layers of society, how could we govern this space? What part should the military play in this? war. It is generally supposed that 80 to 90 percent of those affected by war in the physical domain today are civilians, so the Guardian suggests. Would we expect the same in cyber? If that's so, why do we need the military in cyberspace? Good question. And I'm out of a job. No. So one of the reasons I've been looking at policy and strategy is because of this mix between military and society. And I find it a really interesting dichotomy. And I really enjoy the fact that the theme of this conference is true or false. So is it true or false that the military has a role to play in cyber war? In actual fact, what is cyber war to start off with? So let's be hypothetical for a moment. War, what is war? War is a state of conflict. Many nations have war on drugs. Other nations have, in the UK, we have a war on knife crime. You could say that the US have a bit of a war on gun crime. You could say that there is a war on antisocial behavior. So what is war? War is conflict. And there is a lot of talk about threat. What is threat? Well, in general terms to you and me, I talk about the threat of rain. I checked my weather app this morning. Was there a threat of rain in Budapest? Do I need to bring my umbrella with me? Is there a threat that it's going to get cold today? Do I need to bring a coat? A threat is something that is going to happen. We talk about the threat of a drought in a hot summer. We talk about the threat of snow in a bad winter. Currently, I live in Estonia. I know what cold is now. In the UK, we have that much snow and everything stops. In Estonia, we have that much snow and you still get up and go to work. It's been a bit of a culture shock. So we talk about threat. And my, one of the questions that I deal with is, is it really a threat? I think not. I don't think we have threats. I think we have actors. And I think we are already in a state of conflict. Anybody who works in this environment, we all know the sheer number of attacks that happen every single day. Every single minute of every single day, there are thousands of malicious attacks on you, on me, on the government, on the military, on the tax office, on the police force, everybody and anything. All websites, all activity is subject to this level of activity. It's not a threat. It is already there. And what role do the military play in this? Let me think about that. Nothing. So what are the military doing? The military are looking after themselves in the same way that you are looking after yourself and I am looking after myself. So let's take a hypothetical situation. Let's roll forward 20 years. And driving licenses no longer exist. We all get up in the morning and we get on the metro or we get on the tram or we get into an auto autonomous vehicle. There are no such thing as driving licenses. Everything is automated. We just get in something, right? 
we no longer have a choice. We just get in and it takes us to wherever we're going. What if there is a cyber incident that means that all those vehicles stop? In actual fact, no, all those vehicles are rerouted into the center of Budapest and the whole thing grinds to a halt. So you and I don't get to work, kids don't get to school, deliveries don't get to the shops, the whole city grinds to a halt. Are we really going to roll out the military to deal with that? Really? I don't think so. So whose responsibility is it? In Estonia, they, use, they are starting to use robots to deliver the post. By the way, I'm moving around just to keep the cameraman entertained. How far do I go? I can go all the way over here. Look, they're following me. Okay. So, um, they use robots to deliver the post. So my question to them was, okay, so I've ordered something off Amazon, 120 euros worth of gadget, and it's in this little run robot that trundles down the street to my address. There is absolutely no protection on that robot. There is absolutely no security on that robot. So if somebody nicks my 120 euros worth of gadget, whose responsibility is it? At the moment, there are no questions. There, there are lots of questions, sorry, but there are no answers. Nobody is actually fronting up to whose responsibility that is. In an automated vehicle, if the automated vehicle decides to have an accident for some known reason, there is a glitch. There are always glitches. These things are always fallible. There is no such thing as a 100% effective or, or uh, protected system. These things are going to go wrong. Whose responsibility is it? Who's going to take that responsibility and who's going to be accountable for it? None of these things actually exist. So the reason I'm talking about desecuritizing cybersecurity is because I do not believe it is possible for the state to do this. It is not possible for the state to look after all the technology. I do not believe that it is their responsibility. So if you take in the physical world, for example, I love this, um, and I'm really sorry not speaking Hungarian, I didn't get to understand most of what you were talking about in your previous panel. But I love the fact that if I travel, I can look up online what the chances are of having my handbag stolen on the metro here. Or I can look up the crime rate on the London Underground. Or I can look up the crime rate in San Francisco. And I can look up the chances I have of having my handbag stolen, my phone stolen, or any of those other things. But is it possible for me to look up what is the chances of having my identity theft online? What is the rate at which your, um, your Wi-Fi here is protected? What are the chances, what is the rate of which my traffic over that is going to be intercepted? At the moment, I can see no statistics. There is no information, and yet it is happening. It's not true to say it is not going to happen. It's not true to say it's a threat. It's true to say it is happening, and it is now. But this information is not available to us. This information is not shared. This information is not public. But in the real world, in the physical world, I know what those risks are and I can do something about it. I can manage it. I can take responsibility. I can keep away from those dodgy areas of the neighborhood. In cyber, I can't do that. I have no idea really where the dodgy areas are. Okay, there are some areas where it makes sense. But on the whole, I have no ability to assess one network over another. Now, working in the tech environment, this is really interesting. Because most of us do. If I talk to people in the technical world, oh, you all know some little app that you've got on your phone or on your iPad or on your whatever, and you know exactly what's going on on that web. But as a general punter walking down the street, how many people seriously know what their level of risk is? How many people seriously have access to that level of information that help them manage it? And that is only going to get worse when we have smart washing machines, when we have fridges that automatically make us shopping lists because it registers all the barcodes and the weight in all our packages and makes all our shopping lists for us. Quite frankly, I'm waiting for the, swat, the smart washing machine that not only washes and dries, but also unpacks itself and folds all my laundry neatly. I think that's a couple of generations away, but I'm still waiting. So with the advent of all this technology, it is getting further and further and further away from the state. It is getting further away from them, and it's becoming yours and mine. It is in my house. It is in my street. It is in my home. It is in my pocket. It is in my handbag. It has nothing to do with the state. So who's going to look after it? Because they're not going to call the military out. I would also look at it in terms of, let's draw another comparison between the physical world and the cyber world. Let's take junk mail, for example. 
How many of you receive junk mail into your inboxes? Oh, yes. Come on, everybody, this is the interactive bit. Come on, come on, way, look at that, hurrah. I was told that Hungarians don't respond and I could expect a very quiet and subdued audience. Good for you. Um, what would happen if you got that amount of junk mail through the post? We would have a serious shortage of paper, right? So let's take another one. Um, in the old days, apparently, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, we used to have door-to-door -door salesmen, those people that would carry dodgy briefcases, knock on your door and ask if you'd like to buy a toothbrush, stockings, house cleaning utensils, whatever. Nowadays, as soon as you go online and you go to a website, you get those adverts coming up all over you. What if all those adverts that you get online suddenly started to be physical? You'd do people for harassment. You'd do people... Well, we would, well there would be no trouble with unemployment, would there? But, what the, but the thing is, is that we accept this level of behaviour online that would be totally and utterly intolerable and unacceptable in the physical world. Why? Why? And is this not why a lot of the behaviours and a lot of the threat that we see is ongoing and continues and grows? Because as a society, we have become more and more tolerant. We accept that we're going to get junk mail. We accept we're going to get adverts. We accept nowadays that this is all part of it. We accept that our autonomous vehicles are occasionally going to go the wrong way. We accept that we're going to lose some of our postage. We accept. And is this really right? Is this the way that we want it to go? Oh, I can see some of you shaking your heads. Good. OK? So this is another reason why I'm saying the models that we have for policy and strategy, I stand up here and go, I don't think we've got it right. I think we need to look at a different model because there is no way the state is going to look after all that. There is no way the nations are going to look after that. I mean, the poor police forces, I'm really sorry, guys, but you are not going to be able to cope with the sheer number of incidents that happen. It's just not possible, even with the levels that we have today, and those are only going to increase. So the other thing I was going to look at before Arthur sent me his questions, re re rewind, was a little bit of the history as to why I think we've got to where we've got to. So let's roll back to 1999. Okay, this is a bit of a general knowledge question for all of you out there. 1999 was the Kosovo War. What happened during that? Yes, I know there was a lot of war and there was a lot of conflict and it was very physical, but what happened in the, in the virtual world? It was a bit of a first. It was the first time cyber was used to support a kinetic conflict. But it wasn't terribly exciting, it was just a few websites to face and it was a little bit of, of anti-NATO messaging going on. So it was comms. It was all about you and me. It was all about messaging, it was all about influence and it was all about creating that distrust. That was the first time it happened. Roll on a year, or in the same year even, and we had Y2K. How many of you remember all the publicity around Y2K? Cyber Armageddon. Aeroplanes were going to fall out of the sky. Trains were going to crash. It was going to be the end of the world as we know it. How many of you remember all of that? Come on. You can't all be that young. Thank you. Right. So we all remember that. And that kind of, that kind of media coverage, that kind of al alacrity, that kind of alarmism has never stopped. Anything to do with cyber is all about the end of the world. It's all about danger, it's all about threat, it's all about everything that's going to implode on us. The end of society as we know it. That kind of narrative has never stopped. And what actually happened when the clock went over? Absolutely nothing. I don't know of anybody anywhere that actually suffered any kind of impact. Maybe I'm just very fortunate. But I don't remember anything in the press about anything actually going wrong or aeroplanes falling out of the sky or trains crashing. So it was a bit of a non-event. But the press had a field day. The social media of the time had an absolute field day with it. And that's never stopped. So let's roll on a little bit more and we'll look at the years 2007 and 2008. What happened in 2007 and 2008? Two particular things, three particular things. Estonia, Georgia, Belarus, little bit of activity going on there, cyber activity, 
that then supported physical activity. In actual fact, in Estonia, it was the other way around. It was physical rioting that then went onto the internet. Most of the others, it was internet activity followed by physical overtaking. But all of that was low tech. The most exciting thing that happened was a DDoS on a large scale. So well, not, not particularly technologically advanced. But again, the focus was very much on the state. The focus was on government websites, uh, on uh, telecommunications, um, and, it was very, it, and it was very much focused on national level. So the policies and the reactions and the, the counter to that was all at a national level. So that's 2007, 2008. That's 10 years ago. Now, we work in this field, and we know that the technology we have today is vastly different from that we had 10 years ago. But none of the policy and none of the strategy has changed. We are still stuck in that policy and strategy that we had 10 years ago, which is all about the state and national institutions looking after it, national institutions taking care of it, national institutions defending it. And yet, that's not where we are. That is not where we are. So you, then you roll on to the years 2010 to 2014, I think. 2010, what happened in 2010? This word is banned from all my presentations. I will not utter this word. What happened in 2010? Come on, somebody must know. It happened to be a, a nuclear power plant somewhere. Thank you. Okay? And the reason I say I don't use that particular word is because everybody rates it and everybody talks about it. Every lecture and every speech I go to talks about it, so I refuse to, because it's not the only example that happened. That was in 2010. 2000 and, and then over the period between 2014, what else happened? We had an attack on a German steel mill. We had an attack on a... Yeah, good, we've got nods going on over there. We had an attack on a, power, on a water processing plant in the US. So chemicals got into the water system and that went to your house and your school and, and the kids and the hospitals and everything else. So there was polluted water in the system, all thanks to a cyber attack. We had attacks on, oh, the other one that's very, that uh, everybody talks about is 2015, the Ukrainian power grid out outage, again, caused by cyber. Now these is subtly different to the previous generation that we had in the noughties. We're now into the tensies, and we, or the teensies. No, we're in the teensies now, whatever they were. Anyway, the tensies. And we had, um, we had uh, this now becomes technological more advanced. It's very specific, it's very targeted, it's very um, technologically advanced. It depends a lot on um, intelligence and having time in the systems, and it's take time to evolve. And what's the response to that? Well, this is where it starts to shift in theory, but I still don't see any policy about it. I still don't see a change in strategy. All strategy says nowadays is that we want cyberspace to be safe and secure to do business. Really? Is that it? There's a little bit more detail, but that's basically it. Policy doesn't account for this. The closest it's got is making it a legislative requirement in some countries that you must admit when things go wrong. That's as close as it's got. So it's making it a requirement for us to share when things go wrong. But that's not really helping us tackle it, is it? So we have now this change into national infrastructure. We have this change, but all national infrastructure in most, com in most countries is owned by private sector. It's not actually governmental owned. It's not a state business. Most countries now, it is privately owned. So it's still not a state business. So why is the state... So I, I honestly, I have to say, I really struggle with this idea that if you do have a power outage, really, are you going to roll out the troops? Really? If your local power station goes down... Isn't, is, it, as members of society, isn't what we do? We go to the kitchen cupboard and we get the torch out and we get the candles out and we find the lighter and we light a few candles. We get the camping stove out, make a cup of tea and wait for the lights to come back on. Isn't that what we do? Yeah. It's what we used to do anyway. I don't know what we do now. But we practice it, don't we? So most of us have experience of going, out, going without electricity. Most of, most of us have got, um, have got torches, most of us have got candles, lighters, etc. Most of us know how to do without water because every now and again they have to do work on the water main, so we know how to do without water for a couple of hours. Are they really going to roll out the forces, the Navy, because it's water? Are they really going to roll out the Navy because I've got a water shortage in my neighbourhood? I can't see it. Um... But we know how to deal with it. We have bottled water, or you go around your neighbor's house or your mum's house or whatever, where the water is still working. But what about connectivity? How many of us practice going without connectivity? Oh, my 
my God, put your mobile phone away for half an hour. How are you going to contact your kids? How are you going to know where your kids are? How are you going to know what your mum's doing? You know? How are you going to cope without your mobile phone? Most of us are incapable of doing it. I do a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things. And uh, yesterday I was at, I was at the university um, in, 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 in Pest. And uh, I found it really interesting that there were two students in that particular lecture hall who were unable to put their phones down for half an hour. All the way through. And I thought, now I don't know. Now I hate to, I hate to, but most people, if you're busy texting and you're busy reading what your mates just said and what's online and all the rest of it, are not really listening to what's being said. It's very difficult for us as human beings to be able to seriously concentrate on two things at once. I know all the tech guys over here are doing it. They're all looking at all their technology and watching films and things and hoping that nothing happens up here. Okay? But it's, it's, a, general, it's a generalistic thing. So how many of us can seriously cope without our mobile phones for a day? It's really tough. But we practice this. So, so my other thing is, is this, if there is a cyber incident, let's, let's look at it from a different way. If there is a cyber incident, let's say a chemical plant. Chemical plant is, a, is impacted. Chemical plant explodes. So you have noxious fumes, you have toxic gases, you have... Um, uh, chemicals going into the local water supply. What are you going to react to? Are you going to go, don't worry, we'll call IT? Are they really going to fix the fact that you've got noxious fumes? Are they really going to fix the fact that you've got polluted? Well, no. What you're going to respond to is you're going to respond to the effect. In a situation like that, it may actually be days, weeks, or months before you know that it was something cyber that actually caused it. So the other thing that I put to people is that you're not actually necessarily going to know that it was a cyber attack. If you have a rail incident, Thousands of people injured because you've had a, a, a crash between two trains. What are you going to respond to? Yeah, quite. I can see a few people raising their eyebrows and thinking about it. You're going to respond to the fact that you've got thousands of people there injured. It's going to be a civilian response. The fact that you are going to have to investigate what it is becomes much, much later. So again, with all these things, I do not see that it is a national... Oh, you're right, I am over time, aren't I? I am sorry. It's there in red, and I've completely ignored it. Um, it's, it's not going to be a military response. So, Arthur, I'm really sorry. The answer to your question is absolutely nothing whatsoever. And it's taken me all this time to say that in the last three seconds. I will just finish really quickly. Promise, promise, promise. Um, you may wonder why the panda's here. Okay, the panda is here because the topic is true and false. Black and white, ones and zeros. So I think this is a great logo. And what I love about this is that your truth is not mine. And my truth is certainly not yours. So what is true and what is false? I don't think there are any answers in this domain. Anybody got any questions? I drink coffee, white, no sugar, and I'm around this morning. Thank you very much.